everybody. Welcome back to another episode of C is for Creepy. Thank you to everyone who listened to last week's episode. Yeah, it was great to see all of the downloads and the listens. And as always, we love seeing new reviews come in. So make sure you post them. Or- yep, for sure. And then make sure to send us an email at C for Creepy at gmail.com if you have any questions concerns any stories you want us to cover that would be amazing yeah absolutely so let's get right into it are we not gonna share a friday the 13th horror story okay (laughs) okay so technology hates me just heads up and we originally recorded our episode on friday the 13th so to start with, my printer wouldn't work. Um, I was <laughs> rushing to finish my notes to get over to Courtney's so we could record. <laughs> then we do all the recording and we're like, hey, nothing seems to have went wrong. Not we might way. yeah. We might be blessed. No. Just kidding. Here we are. <laughs> Re-recording. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> the Friday the 13th cursed us little bit usually it's a good day for me but technology was just not my friend no so tell me about your story again okay well hopefully you don't remember it i I... actually don't (laughs) (laughs) i'm gonna be honest with you awesome good i don't remember yours so at least we're both starting at the same spot yeah all right so this week for l i'm gonna be covering a topic that is relatively new given the digital age that we are in live stream crimes oh yes 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 okay okay so for those of you who don't know a live stream is a broadcast of a live event over the internet and that's according to miriam webster good old miriam webster the very first instance of a live stream happened on june 24th 1993 when a band called Severe Tire Damage was able to broadcast their gig using a network called M-Bone, or Multicast Backbone. That's cool. Yeah. So, like, it's just got to be over the internet. So, and I don't know, it still surprises me that 93 there was already... Internet. Well, in the works, like, able to broadcast in real time... Like, video and audio. So, live stream, does it have to be video and audio? Or can it just be one or the other? Hmm. Is there, like, a... I don't know if it is that specific to video and audio. I think it just has to be something recorded and viewed in real time, transferred over the internet. Okay. The internet is a key. Yes. Okay. Don't quote me. That is my theory. Okay. Okay. So other companies built upon this event, perfecting live streaming to what we know today. So like Facebook Live. um, TikTok Live. Yeah. Pretty much any social media site you find, there's some live option. Mm -hmm. Although it is much more common now with social media being in everyone's pocket, we are going to be talking about live stream crime. So... Crimes have kind of been recorded by the perpetrators for decades, Mm -hmm. right? Now you can just share it with millions of people at the click of a button. Mm Mm-hmm. Which is so much more scary. I don't know. I would hate to be somebody just, you know, going about my day and somebody I know is just posting a crime taking place. Like, Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. No, that is scary. So there are some common theories why people might live stream themselves committing a crime. Narcissism? Kind of, yeah. Yeah, especially to start with. So in an Guardian article published in 2017, they interviewed Raymond Surratt, a professor of criminal justice at UCF, who says that this isn't new criminal behavior. Many different types of criminals have left a signature or reached out to police in order to flaunt their crimes. As if performing these crimes for spectators, these perpetrators thrive off of notoriety. Uh 
In today's age, it's even easier to have an attentive audience view crimes firsthand. Yeah. Another aspect is, especially in today's age, most people don't think twice about filming notable events around them, right? That, oh, well, if you didn't... if you, So you there's didn't, no pictures? It didn't happen. Yeah. Right, so uh, that kind of mentality transfers... They also. could just be doing it out of sheer instinct. Exactly. Exactly. Growing up constantly filmed and documenting every moment for posterity could lead an individual that were committing a crime for it to simply be an instinct to just grab a phone and start recording. Yeah. Like, which is even more strange. Like, because, you know, preservation could should kick in, being like, hey, I'm recording myself committing a crime. I should not do that. And I'm live streaming it. Right. It's not like you're keeping it for your own sick personal collection. No. You're sharing it to the world. Mm-hmm. That's disgusting. Right? Your brain should just kick in and say, not a good idea. Th- that's a bad impulse. Stop. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to assume that's probably why this guy got caught, but... Mm, you could assume that. As far as live streaming crimes go, it is often more difficult for victims, as not only have they went through the attack, but the attack is then out there for the rest of the world to view. And once it's on the internet, it's forever. It is. And I think it's even less like, oh, somebody's seeing it happen. It's just in their minds, you know. Everybody watched the torment I went through. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's horrible. Mm-hmm. And I think this goes back to, like, you have to be some kind of sick individual, you know, to record it to begin with. Mm-hmm. But keeping it for your own little box of treasures, you, to put it into the world, like, you are just a disgusting human being. Mm-hmm. And even though your damage is done, there's still that psychological damage of... Yeah. That video still exists. Right. Well, and, like, you get that with instances of CSAM, where these children have been recorded that have now grown up to be adults, and that is still out there. Uh And it's not, like, it's, people still have access to it. Yeah. No. It's gross. Absolutely. All right. While many social media platforms have AI moderating videos that are posted, they don't catch everything. And what's more is it is really difficult to stop a live stream as you don't know what's going to happen next, right? Like the AI can only work so fast. So as it's recording in real time, it can't flag it immediately. Mm -hmm. It is left in the hands of the people to view crime to report such incidents and not just hope that someone else will. And depending on what website you're on, they might be there for those nefarious things. Indeed. So just... If you're going to go about your day, if you notice something and you see something wrong, here's my PSA. Just report it. If you see a crime taking place, report it. It shouldn't. We can't let the internet keep us anonymous and just not report. Mm -hmm. Can't be a bystander. Yeah. Okay. I'll get off my soapbox. (laughs) (laughs) On to my case. So, I will preface, this is going to be a very dark one, and to be frank, any case that I would have picked would have been very dark. There is something inherently evil about not only maliciously attacking, harming, or murdering another person, filming it for personal use, like, but like Courtney had said earlier, for it to be out there live for an audience, it just makes it that much worse. It's disgusting. So that being said, I am going to throw in a quick warning at the beginning of the case. Um, Some discussions that we're going to be talking about is grooming, rape of a minor, child sexual assault material. So if you do not want to hear those topics, I totally understand. Just skip ahead like 30 minutes to Courtney's story. Um, She's going to have to sit and listen, so... Yes, unfortunately, I'm stuck here. (laughs) Again. (laughs) But yeah, 
So I will add, even though... Have you noticed that it's always the super dark ones? Uh-huh. That we have to do twice. Uh-huh. I <laughs> I'm a lucky gal. You sure are. <laughs> At least Jeff was had to listen live last time. This so. is true. <laughs> okay. So even though this case is very dark, it does have a happy ending. I'm going to be talking about the case of Alicia Posevich. Alicia was born March 23rd, 1988 to Charles and Mary. The family was living in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 2001. While the internet was not quite exactly new at this point, it was still not as accessible as it is today. Mm -hmm. Sorry, what year was that again? 2001. Okay, so that was the year of, like, family computers. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Alicia was 13 years old and could use the family computer to play games or chat with friends. All right. It was her older brother that really introduced online gaming to Alicia. And while he enjoyed games like Diablo, um, she saw the potential for the internet as a way to meet new friends to play these games. Oh, okay. The family computer was set up in the living room. While her parents had talked to the teen about stranger danger, she did not apply those rules to the internet because, like, she had said, well, if you meet somebody on the internet, you get to know them and they're no longer a stranger. That's kind of how she justified it in her 13-year-old brain, which, to be fair, Mm -hmm. I think I have done that, too. Oh, 100%. In fact, nowadays, we ask strangers to come to our homes to drop off food, or we get into strangers' vehicles to go places. So, this is true. Like, I mean, I get where she's coming from. Oh my goodness, I remember one time I ordered Skip the Dish, and Buddy, like, opened my door. Oh. It was the scariest moment <laughs> of my life. <laughs> But sorry, continue. <laughs> you are correct. We invite strangers to our house all the time. Every, like, all the time. <laughs> Especially after 2020. Like, that was so and, common. Yeah, and like, buy and sells. Like, here's my address. Come pick it up. Mm-hmm. Oh, yep. Yeah. And as adults, we do it. But you don't <laughs> think about it because you just... Well, now it's common. Now it's... Like, well, and you think about the good in people, even though I think I personally would never go to somebody's house alone. No. Ever. No. Um, But you like to think the good in people. Mm-hmm. But this poor girl. So, it was through a Yahoo chat room that she met a new friend. Of course it was Yahoo. <laughs> <laughs> the friend who called herself Christine was actually a 31-year-old man named John. And John was pretending to be a 14-year-old red-headed teenager. Ew. Alicia was only slightly perturbed, though, when she found out that her new friend was not who she said she was. So she found out this girl she was talking to was a 31-year-old man? Yes. And she was like, she was definitely unsettled by it. But a few hours later, she rationalized it that, well, like, This person has proven to be a friend. Like, what does it matter what they actually look like or who they actually are? It was somebody that she could confide in. They talked about crushes. Like, they became close. So I think it was easier for her to rationalize. Okay. Okay. You know, I think something can be said about... You know how they say don't text when you're angry Mm because tone doesn't come across? I feel like the opposite can be done with child predators. Uh-huh. Is they're so wooing. Uh-huh. They know exactly how to get you in. Uh-huh. Which I think makes it just so much grosser. Yes. I agree. So it was through John that she met another new friend named Scott Tyree. So I do want to add for this particular section here. I only read this part on one source. So I I do want to just preface it. There's been other varying reports of how she met Scott. Um, So that was from a Covenant Eyes article last day, updated in 2020. Okay. As well, in all of her interviews, Alicia says that Tyree did not make his actual age known and portrayed himself as a teenager. But no red flags went up when the 31-year-old man... 
said, here's my sin. Oh. But I guess if this 31-year-old dude was talking to other teenagers, like, who is she? Yeah. I don't know. Like, either way, yeah. no good. Just not good. No. So Tyree was respectful, thoughtful, and kind to Alicia. Alicia was staying up late into the night, talking with Tyree. Even though the computer was in the living room, her parents had gone to sleep, so there was no one to monitor conversations. Mm, as young girls do. She was happy to have a guy that she could turn to for advice or for someone to vent to. Like, this was a person who validated her. Like, if she had got a bad mark, he would tell her how smart she was. If she was not having a good time in school, he would tell her she's so beautiful. He really buttered her up. Okay. Like I said, he treated her like she was beautiful and special, and soon she felt obligated to always be there for him. Okay. Gradually, Tyree turned their conversations from the innocent antics of youth to ones of a more sexual nature. Gross. Alicia, who at this point was so dependent on the validation of this online stranger, gave Tyree what he wanted, so that kind of looked like a mirroring mirroring those mm -hmm. conversations back like she was telling him the stuff that he wanted to hear so that was explicit conversations and um i read somewhere that they did exchange photos mm -hmm. so over a period of nine months this friendship grew to the point where alicia's online friend asked to meet alicia was happy to oblige even if it was just to step outside of her house and go say hi to him. Ugh. It was the evening of January 1st, 2002, when Alicia was asked to meet her friend Tyree outside her home in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. Alicia left between dinner and dessert after telling her mom she had a stomach ache and was going to lie down. She had snuck out into the cold, dark evening. Okay, wait. Who chose the time? Because, like, if you think about it, if some random guy off the internet was like, and it's January, so it gets dark really early. If somebody's like, hey, come meet me at 7 in this park out front of your house, would you go? As an adult, I definitely would not, and there'd be some red-ass flags. As an adult, yeah. But as, as a 13-year-old... I remember being such a dumbass at 13 this and meeting true. up and, like, drinking in the field with my friends. You know, like, let's be real. 13-year-olds are kind of, like... We're dumb. A little bit. Yeah, my inner teenager was, like, she was a dumbass. But my now adult with a child brain is, like, what the fuck? Fuck. Uh, yeah. My crazy ass has sensors on the doors. I Front feel door open. <laughs> yeah, I've had those since I was like a child too. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I think too, we grew up, like us, we were growing up learning about online stranger danger. Like that wasn't a thing in the 2000s, right? Yes. That wasn't a thing then. We were talking about cyberbullying and making sure you knew who was on the other end of the computer. Yeah, we were on, like, the second stage of, like, internet explosion. Yeah, so while we still fucked around on in chat rooms and stuff, we weren't giving out personal information. We weren't doing that. Well, at least myself, personally, I wasn't because that's what I was taught. Mm-hmm. Anyways. No, we just met up with random people in the... Mask of darkness in a field. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> they were people we knew. It's just... Oh, uh. maybe not. <laughs> uh. Okay. My adult brain is having a mental breakdown. <laughs> Thinking, the fuck? Oh. Isn't it fun to look back? <laughs> no. Oh my god, we're lucky we survived. <laughs> yup. Yup. Okay, so Alicia had walked down the block and she had heard nothing. Just silence hung in the air. The red flag. It was the outside feeling, the painful bite of winter. 
that Alicia started feeling the warning bells go off in her head. Okay. And she started asking herself, what am I doing? So she turned around and started heading back home. But that's when Alicia heard her name. The next thing she remembers was Tyree grabbing her hand so hard she felt like it would break. And then she found herself in his car. Okay, question for you. Tyree told her he was a teenager, but they exchanged pictures. Mm -hmm. Was he lying on the pictures or do we not know? We don't know that. Um, Because a 30-year-old man does not look like a 17-year-old. No, no way. Like even damn near almost 30 Jeff doesn't look like the same guy that I was dating when we were 18. No. So I'm not too sure about that. I'm going off of her account. Okay. So, so we don't know if he was actually, like, sending her pictures and she just never questioned it no, or... No, exactly. Okay. The man was tall, roughly 300 pounds, and he had long, dark hair. He definitely catfished her. I'm thinking so. <laughs> okay. I'm fairly certain so. <laughs> Sorry, continue. He greatly overpowered the young teenage girl. She remembers him telling her to, quote, be good and be quiet. And if she didn't comply, he had made room for her in his trunk. Yuck. They drove five hours from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to Herdon, Virginia, going through toll booths and ending up at the 38-year-old man's house. What is a toll booth? So, and this, I think there's some in Canada too, but they're common along interstates where you have to stop and pay a toll to use that road. Oh. Yes. So there's an attendant there and she was like, should I, should I say for help? Maybe they'll recognize that something's wrong. And it was her fear. I think she was just too scared to say something. Okay. But either way. But yeah. Could you imagine having a pay to use a road? Yeah. Fuck that. Yeah. No. I don't even like to pay for parking. <laughs> you should never have to pay for parking, especially on our roads, which are garbage. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Okay, this is where it gets dark. Dark, dark. So once there, Alicia remembers being pulled from the car into the house and dragged downstairs into a cold basement. Hung along the walls of the basement were sadistic torture devices. Yuck. Alicia was petrified with fear when the monster who abducted her removed her clothes and informed her that, quote, this is going to be really hard for you. It's okay. Cry. Ew. He then forced a locking dog collar around her neck and proceeded to rape her. So because Alicia was a teenager when this happened, what specifically happened to her is sealed by the court, and she has not spoken about details and for, like, with her own privacy in mind, absolutely, I understand. What she has disclosed is that when she was kept by Tyree, she was chained by his bed and was not permitted to wear clothes. The chain she was attached to was long enough for her to go to the bathroom, at least. Honestly, I would pee on his floor. (laughs) Somebody like that, I would not want to imagine the repercussions of doing something like that. And at 14. Um, that too, but like she said at one point that she was like trying to fight him off and he broke her nose. Oh. So. Oh. She did what she had to to survive. Okay. To quote Alicia, he was very abusive and extremely sadistic. Oh. And over a four day period, he beat, tortured, and raped her repeatedly. Tyree told Alicia that, quote, I'm beginning to like you too much. Tonight we're going to go for a ride. End quote. Before he left for work that day is the first time that he fed her. Oh, that poor girl. Uh huh. Alicia felt in her gut that she would either be killed that night or sold for human trafficking. But let's not forget what this week's topic is. It's live streaming. And I would not be covering this case if that did not occur. I'm mortified. Okay. In Florida, 
A man who was friends with Tyree received an instant message from him the night of the abduction. It contained a picture of a distraught young girl with the caption, I got one. Allegedly, this anonymous man claimed that he thought the picture was a fake, but then started seeing videos made by Tyree broadcasted in real time, all featuring the rape and torture of the same girl. Oh my god. After stumbling upon a missing poster of Alicia and realizing this is the same person, the Tampa man feared that he would be in trouble as well and could be charged for being an accomplice to the many crimes committed against this girl. For real? Not the fact that, like, a woman could potentially be tortured and raped and potentially murdered. Uh Uh-huh. You're worried about the repercussions of you knowing about it. Uh Uh-huh. What an asshole. Right? And, like, you got, you can't tell me if you are somebody that he thought you would enjoy this broadcast. Like, no, you're sick. Yeah. Anyways, he made a call using a telephone booth to FBI and gave them the information that he had about the kidnapper, Tyree's Yahoo screen name. <clears throat> and so the FBI launched an investigation into Master for Teen Slave Girls. Oh! And I, to be honest, also dry heaved when I read that one. That. <laughs> no. I feel like anything that has to do with sexual teenagers or sexual children as a screen name should be off limit. Like, sorry, what was it again? Master for Teen Slave Girls. Okay, automatically put that in. You're fucking banned from this site. Your whole URL is. No, thank you. Mm hmm. Like, that should, that should be a red flag. It really should be. Anything to do with sexuality and children or sexuality in teenagers should be, mm -mm. or fetishes in kids, no. No, I agree. That's disgusting. Mm -hmm. A Washington Post article I found says that his profile had his picture, and this is quoted directly from the article. So, it lists his hobbies as training young female slaves to serve him in all ways. Yuck. His latest news was that he was looking for young slave girls to train in real life. Sorry, do we know what website this ad is on? This is actually the Yahoo That she was talking to him on? Yeah. Oh my god. Yep. This isn't even like dark web shit. This is just out for anybody to see. Uh Uh-huh. A hundred percent. Ew. So the FBI made a request to Yahoo's vice president to obtain the IP address. And with that information, they were able to learn his name and find his address. Was he sending these videos over Yahoo too? That I do not know. Okay. I do not know that for sure. I can neither confirm nor deny. Okay. Scott William Tyree was 38 years old. He was divorced. And he had a 12-year-old daughter. Which makes it... Vile. Vile. In fact, according to the same article, Tyree had dropped his own daughter off at the airport hours before abducting Alicia. Vile. Mm -hmm. Tyree was also a programmer. January 4th, while Alicia was fearfully awaiting for Tyree to return at 4.30 in the afternoon, so he was expected to return at exactly 4.30. Okay. Okay. At about 4.10, though, she heard a very loud bang. Terrified, she quickly hid under the bed and heard heavy footsteps on the stairs. She heard men calling out, We have guns! And when they entered the room, she read the FBI on their jackets, and she knew she was finally being rescued. FBI agents covered her up with a jacket and cut the chain that was around her neck off. That would be absolutely terrifying, having to have a chain cut off your neck. Right? I... No more terrifying than what you just endured, but... Well, at least there's, like, that relief that it's finally off. Yeah. (sighs) This poor girl. She was reunited with her family and was able to start the healing process. During her attacks, 
she would disassociate from herself Mm -hmm. just to escape the pain that she was feeling. Yeah. During that process, she lost, like, she suffered from amnesia. Mm -hmm. So she suffered, um, she lost memories from her childhood. Like, her grandfather had passed and she didn't remember his death. Um, she lost a lot of her childhood memories. And during one of the interviews, she had said, he didn't just attack me. He stole my childhood. Well, he did in more ways than one. Mm -hmm. So this man, would it be safe to say that he is just a slimy, living in your parents' basement kind of guy? He is a wife, -wife, um, ex-wife, had said that he was a... uh, like a typical long haired, like ponytail guy, like typical ponytail kind of computer guy. Okay. That was her words to describe him. And I'm not saying that every computer guy. No, but if he's on the internet looking for teenagers. I mean, if your name is Master for Teen Slave Girls, I feel like that should be a red flag, but. <laughs> it should be. You know what? No, it shouldn't be. It is. Yeah. It is. I feel like that might be the uh, the sign. Oh, gross. Yeah. So Alicia did counseling to help cope with the trauma she went through. And at 14 years old, she chose to become an advocate for other child victims. And she started the Alicia Project. Oh, wow. That's really brave. Mm -hmm. She went to schools, companies, and other law enforcement agencies educating the importance of internet safety. She's also working alongside Protect to pass Alicia's Law in all 50 states, which would provide funding for Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. Nice, okay. Alicia has also since earned a master's degree in forensic psychology and has told her story on many talk shows. She's also had a couple of documentaries done, including Alicia's Message, I'm Here to Save Your Life, as well as Alicia's Story. She also didn't ask me anything on Reddit a few years ago, and when asked if she was comfortable with this incident defining her, Alicia's response was, quote, It may be a large part of who I am, but I am so much more than a kidnapped victim or even a survivor. Good for her. Mm Mm-hmm. What a way to grow from something so tragic. Right? And to put yourself out there and be an advocate for the safety of others. And yeah. be an educator. Like, And she's international. She's gone around the world giving talks and being. she's been featured in different like safety videos about that. Like different training videos. Okay. Yeah. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. As for Scott Tyree, he pled guilty to travel with intent to engage in sex with a minor and sexual exploitation of a minor, and was sentenced to 19 years and 7 months in prison. Wait, 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 wait. He wasn't charged with kidnapping or, or, like, holding her hostage? So, my thought there is... Because it was a guilty plea, they were he probably struck a plea deal. Okay. So if he had pled not guilty, they would definitely have all of that, but then he would be sentenced to life in prison. Mm-hmm. So if he pled guilty and they were able to do it, and if he was able to get a deal, then it was for lesser charges. Okay. Gross. That is the justice system at work. Okay. Tyree was released on probation in 2019, but he violated the terms of parole, one of them being no porn. (laughs) But I guess he just could not resist. So he went back for an additional two years in prison. I didn't didn't realize that they can make porn a stipulation of, of your parole. Yes. You would be very surprised at the amount of different, like, parole conditions they have like access to cell phones access to certain people there is a lot of different stipulations to maintain parole to propane to for a probation period how bad do you have to be at covering your tracks to get caught watching porn Mm, 
I'm sure that they would have some sort of tracking on his like phone and well, the, whatever. That wasn't. Well, I guess it could have been a phone because that was 2019. So whatever internet devices or maybe he had a porno mag. Like we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Those are still around. <laughs> Could you imagine being pulled back into prison because you watched porn? <laughs> Ugh. There was controversy regarding his probation as the halfway house he was placed in was located in Pittsburgh. So the Alicia's family was very mad. Like, they were upset and they protested as he was in such a close proximity to them. Mm -hmm. There has been no further update, though, on him. So given the time, he should be released by now, but I can't verify that. Okay. Yeah. But either way, Alicia is an remarkable woman who has gone on and overcome the trauma that she went through and, like, all the power to her. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. That's horrible story. Horrible story, but, you know, at least this one had such a powerful ending. Where mm-hmm. That she doesn't let it define her. She doesn't let it define her. That's wonderful. Yeah, so that is my L for live stream. Thank you so much for that story, Elise. It was interesting. Well, you know, I like to pick interesting cases. Yeah. Okay, what is your L? My L is for Louisiana, the main track swamp. Awesome. Yeah. So, Louisiana is rich with ghost stories. When you have a state that's as old as Louisiana, you're bound to run into a few spirits. While most of the ghost stories are kept to the plantations, restaurants, and even the occasional bar, there's one spooky place that might top them all, and that's the Manchac Swamp, one of the most haunted swamps in Louisiana. Located just outside of New Orleans, Louisiana, Manchac Swamp might just be one of the most beautiful places in the state. Oh, I love a swamp. Same. I would love to live in a swamp. <laughs> Everywhere you look, you'll be surrounded by a sea of emerald green and beautiful cypress trees. Oh, yeah, that's the life. There are several swamp tours and companies that you can rent kayak tours and do walking tours, and they would all love to show you around these beautiful waterways, mm-hmm. which I would love to go. Yes, especially on like one of those boats with the, with the fans. Yes. That I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. That'd be so cool. <laughs> right? Until you've seen an alligator, then I would probably, like, piece the fuck out. Oh, no. I'd be all over that. I love gators. <laughs> oh, man. But there's another side to this swamp that's a little less calming. The alligators aren't the only thing to be feared in the swamp lands. The Manchac Swamp is believed to be haunted by the ghost of Julia Brown. Julia Brown also sometimes referred to as Julia White, was a local voodoo queen who lived in the small town of Frenier at the turn of the 20th century. Cool. She would often sit on her porch singing a little song. One day I'm going to die and take the whole town with me. Okay, I really want to know what tune she sung that in. That's a great question. You know, like, was it like... I'm not singing for... One day I'm gonna die. And I'm going to take you all with me. Or, like, was it really happy or was it, like, really sad? You know what I mean? Like, I feel like the tone is very important to a song. I think reading the story, my personal thought would be it would be more of a morbid death tune. Like an angry, soulful (laughs) tune. At least... That is what my heart feels like it would be. Okay, I'll accept your heart feel. Because <laughs> would you take it really seriously if somebody sang it at such an upbeat pace? I mean, you never know. Maybe, like, you know how horror movies nowadays have a lot of, like, children's songs and stuff playing in them? But they're still creepy as fuck. Yeah, exactly. Because you don't expect that. This is true. So, uh, it could go in multiple different ways. This is true. The voodoo queen Julia White was more reclusive than most, although no less feared. It was said that White enjoyed trying to predict the demise of the surrounding towns as she sat on her porch of her swamp shack, 
where she spent much of her time. Hmm. I want a swamp shack. I do too. I want a swamp shack with a porch. Right? Mm -hmm. And like a rocking chair. Yes. Yeah. She would also make arcane gestures at those who passed by, giving people the evil eye, singing spooky songs about the day of her death, and generally freaking people out. Despite her eccentric ways, White was seen as a potential oracle. Hmm. And many people looked to her predictions for signs of impending doom or misfortune. Interesting. Which, like, I wouldn't want to have that reputation of doom and gloom. I mean, if it kept people away, I don't blame her. But it didn't seem to keep people away. Mm. She was also known to deal out curses to those who wronged her, making her a figure most people at the time were absolutely terrified of. Okay, but what would you have to, like, why would you provoke her? Like, you know that she lives in a swamp, is, like, wants doom and gloom, and is thought to be an oracle. Why would you curse her? Or why why would you you wrong wrong her? her? Like, why? I agree. It's a great question. Silly. One of the most persistent predictions was that there would be some sort of deadly, deadly cataclysmic disaster when she passed on and and she is often quoted as having said one day i'm going to die and take you all with me chillingly shortly before she died in 1915 white chanted this repeatedly and on september 29th of 1915 a powerful hurricane swept through the state destroying the tiny town killing over 50 in frenier and the neighboring town of ruddock the hurricane decimated the town on the day of her crowded funeral. Oh, man. Causing a devastating tidal wave that swept through to kill hundreds of people, decimating three villages according to the lore. Julia White, along with all of those who had been killed at her funeral, were unceremoniously buried in a mass grave somewhere in the swamp. Well, she did take them all with her. She delivered on that. Holy. Right? Oh, yeah. Many believe that the storm was caused by White herself and that she placed a curse on the swamp because she felt like she was being taken for granted. I mean, fair. Mm -hmm. Can't come to me for my oracles if you don't accept me during my hurricanes. Fair. (laughs) On a tour of the swamp, a person claimed the swamp came alive with the sound of gloomy shadows prevailing over the daylight In the distance stood an old, rustic, run-down shack with a lone cross occupying a space next to it. Along the riverbank, a shadowy figure materialized out of nowhere. It drifted towards the burial ground where many crosses stood, the graves of the people who died long ago from the disaster. The wraith-like figure stopped and wailed out a warning, Be ready, they're coming. (gasps) Oh, that's spooky. Right? Now, the skeptic in me just wants to think this is some asshole teenager that just wants to scare our lookers. Or a Scooby-Doo figure. Just like Scooby-Doo villain. Like, stay out of my swamp. Right? I'm gonna wear a costume and... But the fact that it showed up out of nowhere... Mm, Yeah. Gives me the heebies a little bit. Yeah. Especially, like, in the spot of the mass graves. Yeah. Mm. And then from beneath the ground, moans, groans, and screams answered her command as the earth moved in unison with the cries of the dead. A a stench of death permeated the air. Satisfied, the figure retreated and disappeared into the mist. Ugh, that is a spirit I want to be. Right? Many people have claimed to hear screams of the hurricane victims and apparitions of Julia during their tours. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Visitors and locals report spooky tales of moans and screams from an unknown woman's voice. Cries from the victims of the old hurricane are meant are mentioned that can still be faintly heard in the distance. However, no one can be found. Oh. Residents even say the night air rings to a song like that of what Julia Brown used to play on her guitar about her strange death. Oh. Could you imagine just like sitting on your front porch and hearing her tune? I'd be like, nope, we're moving. Uh, yeah, 
Yeah, that was, I, I don't know. In small the midnight real, air? Small real estate, though. Like, you can't give that up. Oh, I guess. That would be a tough one. It would take me a while before I move. I could, I could deal with some strumming on the guitar. Like, can you please change the buddy tune? <laughs> yeah, once was enough. Next song. Right? Do you know anything by the Beatles? <laughs> <laughs> when do you claim to hear... You're all going to die tonight. Oh, okay, yeah. That's uh, that's less friendly. Oh, yeah. So, not only this, the Manchac Swamp is also rumored to be home to the Rougarou and the Cajun Werewolf. Ooh, you've got to cover those. Yeah, 100%. What's a Rougarou? I'm not sure, but we're going to get there. Okay, it sounds familiar. That's why I, I had hoped that you thought it was familiar. <laughs> it does. It sounds super familiar. Okay. So I will cover it. Good. I got all of my information from atlasobscura.com, onlyinyourstate.com, neworleanskayakswamptours.com, mentalfluss.com, Louisiana Haunted Houses, and mysticsciences.com. Awesome. Yeah. That was such a good case. It was. It was something I was really excited to do for quite a while now. I love a swamp. Me too. Louisiana Bayou. I want to be the old hag that lives in a swamp and curses at people. Let's be honest here. Very true. Coles. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Though I don't think there's any, like, solid swamps in Canada. Not, like, what I have pictured. I'm sure in BC they've probably got some, like, swamp adjacent. Marshlands? Yeah. Adjacent. <sighs> I mean, it's not quite the same. There's not no. the trees and... No. There's no gators, that's for sure. You know what? But there's also, like, ticks and... I'm sure there's... Those gross little beetles with, like, the huge antennas (laughs) that are, like, two inches long. (laughs) Are they pine bugs? I don't know. I don't know. But they're nasty. They make my skin crawl. At least we've got mountains. This is true. No swamps. No, not really a swamp. (laughs) Not a swamp in sight. (laughs) Ugh. Okay, guys, that uh, wraps us up for L. Thank you so much for listening. Please make sure to review and subscribe. We really enjoy seeing all of the support. Absolutely. And don't forget to check in next week as we cover M. Yes, and then not this Friday, but the following Friday is our third episode of Nocturnal Novellas. So exciting. So exciting. All right, guys. Thanks for listening. Bye.